for those of you listening in, we, this is Tuesday morning Bible study with the, the greatest wisdom in the world this morning. You'll be, we're in Luke. I think we're still in Luke, the 8th chapter. No, we start chapter 9. Chapter 9. Brand spanking new this morning. Chapter 9. Okay. Alrighty. Brand spanking new. First verse. Luke chapter 9. When Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And if people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on. And he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. <coughs> Others that Elijah had appeared and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. <coughs> okay. All right, let's talk about that for, for just a minute. Uh, first of all, about the twelve, the disciples. He gave them power to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. All right, you remember this is, uh, Jesus is just coming on the scene. Nobody really knows who he is. Jesus does a lot of signs and wonders. There's really only three periods of major miracles in the Bible. People say, why don't God does, mir does miracles today? He still does miracles today. You're, I'm, I'm sitting here today. You're looking at one right here. You know, but when, we, when people talk about miracles, they're talking about big miracles, you know, like healing this blind and the lame and the halt and all that. Miracles were a sign to validate who he was, but many still don't do miracles, but they had, you had three periods. Uh, you had, <coughs> you had Moses and the, the miracles in Egypt. Then you had Elijah and Elisha was a period of miracles. You know, Elijah did, I uh, don't know how many miracles he did, but Elisha did twice as many as Elijah. Because you remember when Elijah, Elijah said, I'm about to go, and Elisha left his oxen and stuff to follow Elijah. And when Elijah got ready to go, you know, Elijah didn't, didn't die, he got caught up. And... Uh, Elisha said, give me a double portion of what you got. He said, if you see me when I leave, you'll have it. So Elijah got caught up in his chariot and got took away. Elisha saw it. Elisha did twice as the number of miracles that Elijah did. So, uh, and then you have Jesus <coughs> at this time where the apostles and all them did. Jesus did all the miracles. So you have really three segments of time where there were a lot of miracles done. And and, and to think about it, um, <clears throat> you need some miracles to do because they, just because people say something, you know, doesn't mean that it's so. So miracles have validated the power of God for people. Well, here he's sending his disciples out to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Now, this passage has particular uh, trouble for those people who don't believe in the devil. Uh, people who don't believe in the devil are deceived, and the reason they don't believe in the devil is that they are deceived. Uh, you, you really can't help but see that there's the storyline in everything in life is good versus evil. I mean, you can't have a storyline if you don't have a villain, there's always good and there's always evil. It's been that way since the get-go. Good versus evil. 
And so he gave them power to, to drive out demons. One of the things we've noticed about demons is what? Whenever they see Jesus, they know who he is. The disciples are with him and they don't they're with him, they don't have a clue. But when the demons see him, what are you doing here? Most high son of God. Well, if you come here to torment us before the time, they know exactly who he is. And the key word there is authority. Authority has been the controversy of the universe forever. It still is today. What's wrong with our culture and society today? We have a problem with authority. We're living in judges. Every man did right in his own eyes. Now, we were talking at lunch this week about, uh, you know, it's as bad as it's ever been. I said, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. ain't even close. I mean, we're sitting here today with open Bibles talking. We had the freedom to come here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not getting thrown to the lines, thrown in jail, thrown into an arena where the lines are eating us up. We're not being human torches and, you know, burned to death for the pleasure of the Romans. And, no, we're, we're not being carted off in, in uh, train trailers, thrown in a gas pit and gas. No. No, it is nowhere near. It's what we think it is. Uh, so, but no, we're 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 so blessed that we should take advantage of that, uh, in the sense that we should be praising God that we're free to do what we do. Yes, yeah, bad. But, What's uh, as bad as what we remember? Is what we remember and have in our through. life. Yeah, you know, and and we, you know. I watch stuff like when the heart calls, when calls the heart. <coughs> y'all watch it? Mm -hmm. Well, it's obvious one, they're not living y'all <laughs> <laughs> So that's part of what to come out, right? Hallmark. Hallmark. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, that would be an edit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, now, when calls the heart is a Hallmark thing. And it's mm -hmm. a little town that a... where they got the really cute little lady that I think she's just cute as a button. Uh, she's the mayor of the town. And the town is just, I mean, the children. The, they got one lady teaches school and the children, yes, ma'am, Miss Elizabeth, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, please. Uh, Jack, you do this, yes, ma'am, Miss Elizabeth. I mean, there's just, and and they don't have armed guards around the little school. Mm -hmm. They don't have metal detectors. They don't have any of that. Mm -hmm. And they're just so nice. And, and when the, you know, the barn burnt down where they're going to have the wedding. I mean, everybody in town pitched in and built it back. and It's just, where did we lose all it? It's respect and honor. And, and a person's word was their bond. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would die before you'd go back on your word. you just lose your own. We don't have any honor. It's like the 50s. It's That's like the, way the, the 50s. 50s were. Absolutely. And when they said something was going to happen, it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know? And now, it's just it's just not quite like it. For people our age, still, if you give me word, you give me word. You give me word. Right. It's not like that for kids. And no. 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 Mm -mm. no. 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 It's not. No. <coughs> we, you know, this is, you know, it, it, it's inbred in kids. kids you know, like Jackson likes chewing gum, and so we pick him up one day. And uh, we'll say, uh, Jack said, can I have some gum, Papa? I said, did your daddy say you could have some gum? Well, not really, but we don't have to tell him. <laughs> 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 we have to tell. Yeah, we do, Jackson. We have, we have to tell him. You know, I don't think we have any idea what kids today are being taught, no. you know, in the no. schools and, and, and what the outside influences of drugs. Yeah. You know, so many other yeah. things that are, I think, impacting yeah. what our kids are saying, seeing, yeah. and doing. Yeah, yeah. So, you look at the way they're doing it; they're not being taught the right things. No, no, they're not. They, they are not. And and even our kids today are not being taught manners and respect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm constantly having to tell uh, Jackson and Kai, do, "Do you want you want something to drink?" Yes. Yes, what? Yes, sir. Or yes, please. Yes, please. You know, it, it's 
I, I was raised that anybody six months older than me was Surrey, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you know, now I still find myself where I'm older than most people still mm -hmm. saying yes sir and yes ma'am. I mean, it's just, it's in just the, respect. In the 50s, you would never have thought of calling an adult by their first name. No, no. It was Mr. <coughs> or, yeah. yeah. And when I, I had 90 year old women at white, at white level, calling me Pastor Ashley. I said, my name is Kenny. Oh, Lord, no, Pastor. <laughs> we couldn't possibly call you Kenny. That would be awful to call the pastor by his first name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, boy, those days are gone. Anyway. Uh, another thing he told them that I think is, is, is a theme that runs all the way through the Bible. Take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tuning. Don't take anything. Wonder went off with with uh, three other ladies for a little girls outing. We went down to Savannah for a couple of nights. <coughs> we invaded Iraq with less stuff. <laughs> Can't rent a trailer. They should. They took a picture of the little thing you get for the hotel that move your luggage. I mean, it was hanging off the size they went for two nights. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And here Jesus is saying, well, this would have eliminated them girls right here off the bat. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, I no love staff, no bag, no bread, no money. Or they had more to eat than I had in three days. They took with them. No money. Well, that was not the truth. No extra tuning. They had two or three codes. Why? Why is he saying that? What, what's the purpose of that? So if you're dependent upon God. I want you to depend on me. Mm -hmm. All the way through. And I go back, and it, there's not a whole lot that I can jump on and say I'm absolutely, positively sure about. One thing I am absolutely positive about. Everybody on the planet has the same purpose to live in total dependency upon God. That's his number one thing. I want you to live in total dependency. What did Jesus say? Without me you can do nothing. nothing. I will be your total source for everything. I want you to be totally dependent on me and I want us to do this together. I want to live in relationship with you. God is, one thing we don't talk a whole lot about, you go to a bookstore, there is not a whole lot about corporate family stuff. It's about nine steps to spiritual maturity. Nine steps to be blessed in your finances or you know. Everything is about me growing in my relationship with God. It's about me and God. God is never into an individual relationship without the body. Why does he give gifts? So you can say, oh, I, I, me and God is having a good time. What's the purpose of the gift? So I can share the gift with the body. You know, the, it, God is corporate. He is family. It's all about family. What does he say? When one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all hurt. You don't hear much about that. You know? uh, I watched a little bit about uh, the other night, I'm, I'm staying up late, and I'm looking at my emails, and I'm flipping through channels. <coughs> Pastor Joel was on. And it, Joel Osteen? Joel Osteen. Mm -hmm. And he's got 15,000 people there. And it's all about, you know, God wants to give you a promotion. I know you're down here at the bottom, but God's going to bless you in an untraditional way. And it was all about God wants it better for you. I think God wants it better for me. I, I do. But if it's better for me, do I have a tendency to depend on Him more or depend on Him less? less. What, what happens if I'm listening to this and all of a sudden I lose my job and I lose my house and my wife leaves me? Yeah. What about that? How do I deal with that? Is God only a God for the ones that's going to bless you in untraditional way? And I'm not trashing anybody's message. I'm just, <coughs> I'm just saying, you got 25,000 people. Yeah, yeah, it's going to get better for me. Yeah, it's going to get better for me. What about those that it doesn't get better for? Did God just leave them? I mean, 
I am sitting here today because God put me in a place where I was absolutely hopeless with no place to go. I had been hurt and wounded. We're on the radio here. But I, I didn't learn to depend on Him because God blessed me. Had God give me, had God give me this church family first, <coughs> it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. I really appreciate this family now because He gave me three or four of them that were thorns in the flesh that I had to learn how to depend on God and not get bent out of shape over people who wanted what they wanted and this and that. And it's, uh, it, you have to learn to depend on it. And it's so much better when you do. I mean, and, it, and it's, it's fun to sit around the table and listen to, to people talk about, you know, I had this lady that I ran into at work and she was pitching all this bit, and I just said, it's, it's going to be okay, and I did, it just didn't bother me, and everybody was around, we got to fix this, we got to fix this. No, we don't have to fix this. It'll be okay, God, to fix this. We don't, we don't fix it. And ultimately, this, it, it worked out. Uh, God just wants us to depend on Him. It's just that simple. But uh, we, we exhaust all our resources before we usually do. You know, wise men do first, what fools do last. So, anyway. Now, if you go in a house and they tell you they don't want it, what did he say to do? Shake the dust off and move on. Thank you. Move on. Just move on. Move on. <laughs> See, now, that's, that's a verse that I didn't, that I didn't take to heart. Uh, I spent years tugging on green fruit with people. They were green. They were not right. They were not ready to hear. But I said, you know, if I could just tell them this, or if I could just persuade them this, they'd give their heart to Jesus. And there were people over here that were just ready to go on with God. But I was so enamored with the challenge of turning this green apple into right fruit. It wasn't ready yet. And, you know, it's just, you run into plenty of people who are, who are, who are ready. And we're not going... Look at the rich young ruler. Jesus said, uh, <coughs> keep the commandments. I've done all of that. Okay, there's one thing you like. Go sell everything you got. Come back and follow me. God went away exceeding so You do not see Jesus chasing him down. Say, you can make it at installments. You can just sell a little bit at a time. He let him go. Just let him go. That was his decision. I said, why didn't you chase him down? You don't run into many people like that. <laughs> the first thing we do in this class is we turn off our cell phone. Apparently, that's the second thing we do. <laughs> this, is, this has never happened until we get on the on the tube here. So. Well, we've had three so far. Three. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Oh. Expound a little bit on. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against. Yes, them. I, I wondered this. about that. Yeah. Well, <coughs> <coughs> oh, no, let's, let's see. Shake the dust off your feet, a sign of repudiation for the rejection of God's message, and a gesture showing separatism from everything associated with the place. Mm -hmm. So you go know, tell them I don't want that. It's don't like an you. in your face. It's like yes. Yeah. You, you tell them is. they offer it to you and they say, yeah. forget about it. Oh, okay, good. But you know, somewhere in the scriptures, and I don't know where, it, it refers to the fact that each one of us, you know, has a different role to play at a different time. Sure. You know, whether you're a seed planter or you're a cultivator or you're a waterer or whatever you are. So, following on what you were saying, trying to make that green apple right, you know, maybe you just had to do a certain thing at a certain time and somebody else will do something a little later too. Yeah. And maybe as you kick the dust off your feet, yeah. that plants a seed, seed. Right. with somebody that's 
moves on to another step. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. <clears throat> I I had people in in churches that I was in earlier that if you didn't meet somebody for the first time and close the deal and get them mm -hmm. to say the sinner's prayer that they hadn't done what God said, <laughs> you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not a selling a car. You know, mm -hmm. you walk on the lot and I got to get you to sign, close the deal yeah. before you leave. <clears throat> It's planting seeds. You plant a seed, and somebody else may come along and fertilize it. Somebody else may come and water it. And somebody else down the road may harvest that sure. seed, and I may never see them again. But <clears throat> I just think God does that as we go. And, and that's why, you know, you talk to everybody. And some people, uh, to go along with, with what I talked about Sunday school, you're, you're not what you think. Uh, I go back to a time in, in Shelby, and I think I've shared this story before. I went to the hospital every day in Shelby. Every day. And that was back in the day when somebody had surgery, you got there before they went up, you stayed there all day until they got out, and you prayed with them. And mm. I was in the hospital all day, every day. I don't know how I got anything done, but I was there all day, every day. Because nobody else could do that because that's what you pay the preacher to do. Hmm. You know, that's what I was told. So I just something had happened and I'm just really upset. I'm just aggravated to death. And I don't feel like me and Jesus are real close at all. So I get on the elevator and there's this lady standing over there and she's crying. And the Lord said, Go over there and ask that lady what's wrong. I said, I don't feel like it. <laughs> I said, I didn't ask you if you felt like it. I want to talk to that lady. <sighs> okay. So we'll go over there and talk to her. She tells me that, her, that they got a bad report on her husband. She didn't know what they were going to do. They had two small children and all that stuff like that. And uh, what said, I want her to pray for her. So I just put my head, arm on her shoulder and prayed for her. And uh, when we walked out, she said, God must have sent you here today. I feel so much better today. And I walked out of the elevator, and I was still just as ticked off as I was. And God said, I don't need you to be in a good mood for me to live through you. That was a new concept to me. Because I believe if you didn't feel like you were on your A game, God couldn't use you at all. You had to be perfect. You had to be in a good mood. You had to be feeling righteous. You had to be feeling holy before God could ever use you. I said, no. Lord, if that was the only time I got to use you, I would never get to use you, boy. You know? <laughs> so, you know, God's, God's not into this. You know, I can't use you until you're just perfect. But most people think that now. And it's not like that at all. It is not like that at all. And I, I'm saying that God's pleased when we're in a bad mood. I don't think it's a police line. I think it's just a fact of life that we live in an earth suit and a fallen world and your moods are going to swing. God meant for them to swing. He meant for them to swing. How can you just believe in... If, if you're always in a good mood, it's easy to believe God, isn't it? Easy. But when you're in a really bad mood and everything, it's a lot harder to depend on God. Well, God wants it to swing that way because, see, He's God whether you're over here or whether you're over here. And people say, well, God can't want you to be. Why did God create us that way? So we learn to depend on whether you're feeling good, feeling bad, whatever. So we trust Him. And it is so much easier when you do that. That's why somebody created the expression, He doesn't want your ability, He wants your availability. That's exactly right. Which just fits in with what you're saying. Absolutely. God just wants us to be available. And, and you'll get to the place, and, and he's trying to get me to this place, and I'm not there as much. Uh, immorality on television is in your face all the time. It's just in your face all the time. And, and I used to, there they go again, there they go again. 
and, and God's trying to help me to see it and, and the world and other Christians think this is crazy look at this way what did Jesus say on the cross when he died Father give them wine they don't know, they don't know what they're doing. doing they do not know what they're doing they do what they do because they don't know what they're doing you know but by the grace of God go oh, I you know, if I was raised in a godless environment with no family, no home, no church people to love me, I may be just like them. They don't know any better. You know, it's, uh, they really think that what they're doing is okay. It's right. They don't know any better. <clears throat> and, you know, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stoned the prophets, killed them, which I said, you know, it, he wept over Jerusalem. I don't weep over them. I just get mad at them because they ain't living like Jesus. How in the world can they? They don't know Jesus. And, and so it, it should break our hearts more than it takes us off. And, you know, but anyway. I have one more question about the very first sentence. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. So how is that power and authority now always available to us or just at certain times? Uh, I don't think it's available for us like this. Because this is, he called the twelve and gave the twelve his particular assignment. Anytime they used it, it happened. I don't know of anybody like that today. Then you just walk in the hospital and, and. But there are people who pray for others and they're healed. Sure. For, so sure. that would be his power, not Oh, well, absolutely. I'm not denying that. I'm talking about this this thing right here. He gave them power to drive out and to cure cure diseases. I mean, this is a special power given to the twelve for this point in time. I don't think this is a carte blanche for everybody. I don't think everybody, me, you, and everybody can just go anywhere and just call out demons and stuff like that unless God tells us to. Right. This was a particular that. assignment to do that. Mm -hmm. But there is, but Kenny, there is there a power in prayer. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I say, but there is power in prayer. Yeah. That's Absolutely. where we have the power, yeah. mm -hmm. through that, prayer. That's a good point, Jerry, because yeah. wasn't there a time, and I don't know where in the scripture it is, where the disciples were faced with a with a father, with a with a child that had seizures and, yeah, and they couldn't, it, cast, him and they couldn't yeah. cast him out, right. and they went to Jesus and said, "Why couldn't we cast these demons out?" And they said, "Because you didn't pray, because it was a matter of prayer or something." To prayer them. and fasting. This yeah. comes out yeah. in prayer. And yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. even though he did give them authority. Mm -hmm. It didn't know sure. it, it didn't work in that case anyway. Right, mm -hmm. right. it didn't. Okay. And and, and besides, you know, uh, I, I guess the distinction I'm trying to make is, you talk about can everybody do that today? If God tells you to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I'm. Talking. But you look at Jesus. Jesus didn't heal everybody. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why didn't he heal everybody? But he can give that same power and authority to individuals today if if. I mean, it's up to him, not up to us. Sure, that's that's what I'm saying. If you walk by God and say, Sally, pray for this guy, I'll heal him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, we can't walk by and say, I think I'm going to ask Jesus to heal this guy. Unless you can ask God all you want to, but if he didn't tell you to do that. It depends on who initiates. Yeah, absolutely. Desire. And what his will is. Absolutely. And the reason he Jesus didn't heal him, <coughs> he didn't tell him to. Because what did he say? I can only do what my father tells me to do. I can only say what my father tells me to say. Which goes back to what? Dependency. Dependency. You know? Uh, I have been in circles where it was all about me and the power. Lord, grant me the power. Just lay my hands on people and heal people. Uh, there's a... Y'all been around when I read that story about the eye of the needle? I'll have to read that to you next time. It, it's mm -hmm. about that. It's uh, a lady wrote this. Uh, 
And, and it's about, Lord, I, I, want, I want power to be able to lay my hands on people and heal people. He said, okay, go ahead. And I went out there and I laid hands on people and I healed people. But that didn't do it for me. And Lord, I just want to be able to speak to people <coughs> and their eyes open and they open their hearts to you. And he said, go ahead. So I went out there and masses came to Jesus. But it just didn't do it for me. I mean, she kept on asking for stuff, you know, gifts and stuff. Uh, until she came to this place called the Eye of the Needle. And uh, see, it was so small, I couldn't get my gifts through there. I couldn't get my books through there. I couldn't get my stuff through there. I had to strip down totally naked to get through this Eye of the Needle. <coughs> and I had to leave it. And I said, Lord, but I can't go in there without my books. I have nothing without my gifts. I have nothing without this. Okay, if you don't, if you don't leave them behind, you can't come there. So finally, she knelt down and goes through the eye of the needle. And on the other side, her books were there, her gifts were there, Jesus was there, everything was there. But she didn't think she could go without her stuff. And I think that's what God is after. Sometimes we depend more on our giftings and our abilities and stuff to please God. And God really not. He is the gift. He is the giftings. He is He is our everything. But in order to get that, we got to leave everything we got behind and totally depend on Him. Then it doesn't matter what He does. I, you know, I'm, if He doesn't do it, hey, that was His plan. If He does do it, that was his plan, you know. I, I just, uh, he's trying to teach me that. He's trying to teach me that. It, it used to be, and it's easy to do. Uh, when John Deere taught lawnmower broke the other day, so I went to get it fixed, got the wrong part, finally got it fixed. We had to buy another lawnmower. We cut the grass with it one time, got on it the other day, cranked it up, and the, the gears wouldn't work forward and backwards. Brand spanking new, the gears wouldn't work. <laughs> and I call them, call them up, and they'll say, well, you have to bring it over here to Rock Hill to fix it. It cost you $75, and you, are you going to have to bring it over here? I said, oh, whoa, 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 this is not right. Normally, I would have got all tore up about that, and I would have yelled and screamed. Going, okay, Lord, well, what, what are you trying to teach me here? I'm just going to trust you with this. I'm not going to get all the tour up, but I'm just going to go over there and tell them. So I go over there Saturday and I said, listen, I just bought this John Deere on March the 19th. I used it for 30 minutes and I crank it up again and it won't work. And now they tell me I need to take it to Rock Hill or they're going to charge me $75 to come get it and it'll be two weeks before I get it back. Oh, no, sir, we don't do things that way. No, sir, no, sir, no. We'll send somebody out there to get your lawnmower and bring you a new one. <laughs> there you go. Now I could have got all upset about that and lost a day and a half worrying about it, getting all torn up about it. But God's got a plan. He's just got a plan. We get a brand new heating system because ours broke down. We get a brand new heating system. We get an air purifier with it. The guy comes back and says, the air purifier's not working. We call the factory. They have never had one to not work in all the years they've been making. Now I could have got upset about that. The fan, the, the fan motor wobbled. So we're going to have to get another. You get all upset about that. But I mean, they've come back and they've fixed one. You just, you just learn not to get upset with stuff. You just take it. This is just part of God's plan. There's no sense getting upset about it. You just lose in your minutes. Mm. And you just trust God. Just were you all alone when these two things happened? <laughs> oh well no. Well I'm you know what I where I'm going without being edited. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she had opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thoughts. <laughs> so well uh, but so uh, yeah, it, it's just, what did Paul say? I have learned 
in whatsoever state I am yeah. there with the beginning. God does not pixie dust you with that. It's learned over time. You learn that stuff happens. Lightning strikes your house and you know, your yard and tears your stuff. Hey, it, it, it's not a big deal. It's, it's just not a big deal. It's just, it's, you let it go. It's See, there, it, 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 it really, really does. You know, you need to start looking at it as God's got a plan for all this. And it, it's just like Swindoll said, God's not overly concerned with what happens to us. He is tremendously concerned with how we respond to what happens to us. You know, because He's in control of what happens to us. Yeah, but he does want to see how we respond to it. And, and basically every day, what does Scripture say? All things work together for good to them that what? Love God. Now in order for you to love God, you have to trust it, right? Because you can't love you unless... First know Him. Well, we'll see, but well, you can't... You know, this is the thing about love. You can't love God unless He first loves you. And in order for him to love you, That's you right. have to trust him to love you. And if you don't trust him to love you, then you can't love God. So I like to say that verse, uh, all things work together for the good of those that trust God. Because he, you can't love him and he can't love you if you don't trust him. So if you're trusting God, all things work together for good. All things. It don't matter what it is. Broken lawnmowers, lightning strike in your house, just whatever. Don't. Raccoons in the attic, you know. You know what they say? Poop happens in it. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and, but it's just you just never know what God's going to get. And and when you get blinded by disgust and aggravation, some of the things you don't even see what He's up to because you're so distracted by the stuff, you don't even see what He's trying to accomplish. The swing. The swing. That's exactly right. The swing. And anyway, he, he, he's a good God. He doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste a thing. Okay. Uh, so they set out and went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Okay. Now, they think it's John the Baptist or Elijah. Does that verse, that seven through the end, remind you of another particular verse? Do you remember when, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do they say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I did. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. And uh, then he tells him he's going to die. Peter said, Lord, no, that's not going to happen to you. Get behind me, say, I mean, he goes from hearing straight from the Father to being a voice for the devil in about two minutes. Mm. And that's kind of the way it is with us. And then denies it. And then denies it three, denies it three yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll die before I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway. All right. Okay. Can we go on? Verse 10. Verse 10, chapter 9. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. Bethsaida. That's what they said on the documentary. Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed it. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and McDonald's and countryside and find food and lodging 
because we're in a remote place here. There's not another rest stop for 100 miles. <laughs> and he replied, you give them something to eat. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. There were about 5,000 men there, which means that with the women and children, we're probably looking at 10,000, 15,000. Pretty good crowd. But he said to the, his disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. God is an orderly God. The disciples did so, and everybody sat down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of bro broken pieces that were left over. Okay. Alright, it's in here for a reason. What you what you think the point of the lesson is about Jesus feeding the five thousand. Trust in God. Okay. All right. Now, you need to understand that we're looking back. I can look back and see what he was talking about here, but they 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 were right there in the middle of it. Uh, see, I don't know whether this is in relationship to to John six chronologically. You know, because in John six he fed the thousands and. He said, I am the bread of life. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life. If he don't, he don't have anything to do with me. He said, you give them something to eat. Uh, Jesus is the bread of life. Um, it was an impossibility for them to give them something to eat. Five loaves of bread two fish. Five thousand men probably 10,000 so people. Uh, and he just broke it and he gave it to them and they just fed them until they were what? Satisfied. It wasn't, okay, everybody gets a little bite. So, you, you know, you just got that much farther away from starvation. They, they ate till they were satisfied. In other words, they got all they want. And then the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. This act served as an example of avoiding wastefulness and as a demonstration that everyone had been adequately fed. Everybody got all they want, they were still 12 basketfuls. There's always plenty, there's always enough grace, always more than you'll ever need. You cannot out sin or out kill or whatever where sin abounded, grace did what? Yeah. Much more abound. You know. So there's there's always <clears throat> more than you could ever use up. Uh, so what about the five loaves and two fish? What about that? What do you say to a person that says, you know, I, I can't do anything? Well, that's really not true. Uh, we've all got availability and if all you've got is a cup of cold water that's all God asked you to give is a cup of cold water so, uh, I have I think there's a mistaken impression I hear from people uh, I'm an introvert. People think introvert and extrovert. Extrovert is somebody who talks all the time. You know, life of the party. And introvert is somebody that sits in a corner and doesn't talk to anybody. But that's really not how that works. Extrovert and introvert is where you get your energy from. Extroverts get energized from being around people. Introverts, people suck the energy out of introverts. Doesn't mean that introverts don't like people or don't like to talk and don't like to. 
it's just where you get your energy. Uh, and, I, and don't don't misunderstand me when I say this. Introverts are usually those melancholy type people who want to they they want to go deep with people. They're not like extroverts can have relationships that deep all over the place, but they never go past that. You know, introverts would rather have a small group of people that they can go really deep with. You know, that's why I like being. I, I don't think I could go around and spend a week with people and then go to the next town and spend a week with people. I like to be with the same people for years because you really get to know people. You need to know what they're going through and you really bond with people when you know their stories. And but Because introverts want to give their life to something that's going to last for eternity. Everybody is really important. And, I, and, and for me, it, it always bothered me that that I was a non-entity to a lot of people. I mean, I really wasn't important. I'm unrecognizable. You know, people always remember Wanda. We'll go to places 10 years ago, and we'll go back and say, I remember you, I remember Wanda. Everybody remembers Wanda. <laughs> it's hard to forget Wanda. I mean, she's, she's just one. You know, I can, I can be with, I was at, Second Baptist Church for five years. I sat by this woman's bedside when her husband died, you know, and I was gone from there three months. I saw her in a store and I went up there and I said, Miss Ellen, how are you doing today? Who are you? Yeah, I'm just kind of a non entity with people, you know. I know how that makes people feel. So when I talk to people, I want people to feel like they're the most important people on the planet. So when I'm talking to you, I want you to know that I'm talking to you. And I want and that takes a lot of energy from me. Now, you know, one to be an extrovert, she can talk to ten people one time. She can be talking to talking to Jerry. We'd be talking to Jerry, hey Dave, Sally, y'all doing okay? It's good to see y'all. Babe, you all right? Jerry, I mean, she's talking to ten or twelve people at the same time. Just I see you over there and I'll get to you in a minute. You know. Me, I want to focus. And when I go home from church on Sunday, I am zonked. Mm -hmm. I am absolutely zonked. But, you know, people think that introverts don't like people. Well, that's not true. Sometimes our roles dictate how we're supposed to live. A pastor cannot really be an introvert be a pastor. Yeah. No, if you look at it from the sense that they don't like people, they just like to go be by themselves. And they, I love people. I used to not talk to people because I feared rejection. I might say something wrong, and they might tell me what I can do with it, and it would break my heart because I didn't please them. You know. Now, the, the shake the dust off your feet, I used to have a real hard time with that. I said, Lord, I can't do that. I can't do that. I've got, I've got to stay here and make these people believe, you know. But uh, I, I don't, I don't fear man's rejection. What can you say? <coughs> say that I'm completely over that? I'd be crazy, you know. Nobody ever says that. Uh, I, I told him the other day. I said, if Journey were to say we we're sick and tired of hearing all this stuff about identity, why don't you go tell somebody else? I said, boy, this is great news. Well, where are we gonna go from here? We got a new leg of the journey. Now, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. I would have shriveled up and died and probably wouldn't jumped off a bridge. But now I would see that as a tremendous opportunity rather than a, I don't get any ideas. I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, um, but anyway. Oh. Uh, there's another place in one of the Gospels that might have been in Matthew. Have them sit down in groups of 50. It says that that Jesus found a place where there was grass. Israel can be a pretty rocky place over there. And uh, he found a place where there was grass. I call it Cush Bria Tush. You know, it wasn't like sitting on a rock. Jesus found a nice place to sit for Cush on the Tush. He's always looking out for us. Uh, and everybody sat down, everybody ate. 
everybody got plenty. And then they even had 12 basketfuls left over when they got there. Some, some people put a lot of credence to numbers in scripture. So, I mean, is there any significance to five loaves and two fish and hoops of 50 and 12 baskets? There's a lot uh, of numbers in this. They, they are. And, and I guess you could go there. I know five is the number of grace. That's the number of grace. Seven is the number of completion. Uh, Fifty. Uh, Fifty is, uh, uh, you know, they had, uh, Fifty was a year of Jubilee. You know, you had seven years, you know, you have six days of the ground lay fallow, you know, and you have seven weeks of seven mm -hmm. days, and I don't know, 50 days. Uh, wouldn't that be something if we had that again? We're on the year of Jubilee. Everything you owed was written off. Everybody started off for us again. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> Just start off fresh. Uh, that would never happen here, would it? <laughs> uh, some of us would be excited about that, and others would be just not too excited about that. But I don't know, Sally, that's a, that's a good question and a good point. Uh, don't know about the two fish. No. The 12 basketfuls, uh, 12 is the number, I think, the number of government, if I'm not mistaken, because he had 12 disciples. Well, it says he called the 12, twelve. together, yeah. and I'm wondering if that had anything yeah. Yeah, to do with right. it. So he had 12 disciples that were out there picking yeah. up the 12 uh, baskets. Yeah. Yeah. I just sometimes think there, some of this is, we just flip over flip it. Flip over and it, and there's some there significance there. might be some there. real meaning there. Yeah, if we really that's true. It. That's true. Mark six forty says something about the fifty. Look up here and see what it says. Somebody sing a song so we don't have dead air on. <laughs> Mark six forty. Oh. Uh, Taking the five loaves he gave, then he gave to his disciples. So he also divided the two fish among them. They all had forty. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. That's what Mark says. Uh, recalls the order of Mosaic camp in the desert. The word translated groups means garden plots, a picturesque figure. So according to Mark, it's uh, the order of the Mosaic camps, 50s and 100s. So it goes back to, yeah. And, I, and it's also interesting to me that they picked, they picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what they picked up, they broke. Yeah, yeah, it, they didn't waste anything. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times you, in leftovers, you only, you only save the, the whole pieces you don't, but I don't want to save for the little scrap. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. usually those are the best parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And rest. I didn't know the, the next thing that I talked about comes next, about Peter's confession of Christ. He says, verse 18, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? And they re they replied, Some say John the Baptist, which goes back over here to the first part. Some say Elijah. And still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Well, what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. You call that the messianic secret. Why does Jesus not want him to tell anybody? The time hasn't come yet. The time hasn't come. What, what, what do the people think Messiah's going to be? 
He's a king. King. Mm -hmm. A conquering king. It's going to strike down Rome <coughs> and everything. Uh, he said, I don't want you to tell anybody. Because if that gets out, it is going to hinder me from doing what Papa sent me to do. Because they're going to, it, it'd be all over the news and Facebook and Twitter. And it'll blow up everything, and, and and nobody will be able to hear because they're hearing all this. I don't want anybody to know about it yet. And he said, "The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life." And he said to them all, "If anyone would come after me," He must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What do you think taking up the cross is? What's he talking about? You got to go get crucified mm -hmm. every day? Mm -hmm. I think the cross is I crossed out. Oh. Uh, I go back to kind of what we talked about Sunday. The soul is our problem. Most people live in their soul. Most people worship in their soul. How they feel. Uh, the soul has to surrender. It does not mean that you lose your personality, but my soul has to surrender to who I truly am above the line. If I do that, my soul and spirit become one and the same. But the minute I forget that, then it's hard to see up here because my soul is getting in the way. So my soul has to surrender. For example, somebody insults you. What does your soul want to do? Pop off back at it. God says a soft dancer turns away wrath. If somebody smites you on one cheek, you turn the other also. He's not talking about not defending yourself. He's talking about insults. When people insult you and say your mama wears combat boots and you're ugly and all that stuff, Turn the other cheek. What difference does it make? That's just their opinion about you. Does that make you who you are? No. It has nothing to do with you. So why are you getting all upset about it? You worried about your reputation? You worried about what people think about you? No, no don't even don't even worry about that. So our soul has to surrender. Our problem is an unsurrendered soul. It's an unsurrendered soul. Our soul has to bow to who we truly are. When you do that, God's Spirit flows through it. It is the door through which God's Spirit flows. And it, the soul is kind of like the sea. When Jesus got up and calmed the sea, He just said, peace be still. God is the peace speaker. What needs peace? Our soul. Because up here we have peace. Because Jesus is our peace. You look at Jesus in the garden. You know, my soul is exceeding sorrowful to the point of death. I thought you were the Prince of Peace. It is Prince. Peace is a fruit of the what? Spirit. Spirit. It's not a soul thing. Our soul is like this off the charts all the time. But in Jesus, we always have peace. What is peace? Peace is the confidence that God is in control and He has absolute control of my life. That's peace. No matter what happens, no matter what happens to me, good, bad, or ugly, God's going to take care of it. Does it hurt? It might hurt. Might be uncomfortable. Might be aggravating. But God's still in control. Nothing's going to snatch me away from that. That's true peace. Your soul is this way all the time. And we tend to think, well, I'm not at peace. Well, bull feathers, you are at peace if Jesus is your life. Our soul has to line up with that. Jesus can speak peace to your soul. You just have to let it. That's why there's people who are going through horrific times that their soul is just as calm as it can be because they have surrendered their soul to who they truly are. Uh, I remember when Leah died, Coach Atkins, little girl, and uh, she was 22 months, had a rare disease. We were all in the hospital. I remember the day she died, they told her she was not gonna make it. Rita's just holding that baby. Leave. it's okay. You can go home to Jesus, baby. She just smiled and sang to her. And I was over there in a puddle. Mm -hmm. I said, if this was Kia, Lord oh, Jesus, I could not do this. If this was Kia, he said, Kia ain't dying today. 
Lee is dying today. Only give grace, thy grace, to people who are dying. You want grace for Kia in case it happens and you have it stored up, you would have to depend on me. And that's that's the truth. God will give you what you need when you need it. But we want to store it up so we'll have it, don't have to depend on it. It's like I've always said, I'd be a cooler guy in the wilderness. I would just, just in case God don't give me the man of the mall, I want to make sure that I'm a little extra today. I would have been like that. And if you live like that today, people say, are you crazy? Are you not planning? You know, you know people say, yeah. I tell people how much retirement they got, and they almost choke. Like, oh my, you don't have any retirement? Well, we just, God just never had, we, we just don't have that. Well, we got a little bit, but hey, I just figured Jesus is going to take us home before we have to use it. Yeah. Because, you know, we always, always, you make your money, you pay your bills, you wait till next month to get paid, you pay your bills, and that's it. That, you know, we just ain't had money to store up and stuff. So we just, that's the way we do. And people think that's crazy. And I don't have a problem with that because I don't have no choice over that. I, I would hate for God to give me a million dollars. I would hate that. It would drive me crazy about who to give it to and what to do with it. And God knows that. I can't be on that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you give it to. Yeah, I, I, I get you can call it a mistake if you want to, but in Proverbs thirty there's got a there's got a guy I praise. He said, Lord, this is what I want you to do. Don't give me too much. Because I may forget about you. I may have too much and I forget about you. Don't give me too little lest I go out and steal and blaspheme your name. Just give me what you want me to have. And he has been faithful to that. And it, it's been it's been amazing. It's been amazing. You know, we'll we'll go along and we won't have any extra stuff. And when I write checks, we have just enough. Mm -hmm. The next month, we have a $675 fuel pump bill that we have to take the gas tank off and put a new fuel pump in. $675. We write the checks, and we got just enough. It just... And see, we go that way a lot. I don't, I don't think anything about that. There's other people out there who would have connections over that. But see, we're a pastor, and because I'm a pastor, God looks after me better than he does y'all. That's what my niece told me. You know? Well, God's going to take care of you because you're a pastor. Oh, okay. Okay. So that's why my people's lied about me, betrayed me, and kicked me out of two churches because he loves me so much. I hear you. So, another edit. <laughs> okay. Here we go. We got two minutes to go. Why don't we? Uh, two minute warning. Two minute warning. So why don't we just uh, stop right there and uh, wrap it up with any mm -hmm. editorial viewpoints, comments, whatever, and uh, and we'll come back to that section and, and chew on that one a little bit. We're going to stop at twenty three. Let's we'll stop at eighteen and 18. we'll go back and okay. get some context and we'll do that next week. Mm -hmm. I think we'll the study part. Okay. Alrighty. Well, we got two minutes. I just got a question that I don't know why it came up. I got your book. Remind me to give you a book. I read the stuff. Oh, it is it? I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that yeah, sometime too. You probably know my thoughts. Right. Okay. Um, how many people were in the Exodus? From Egypt, well, I've heard all kinds of numbers. How uh, many people left Egypt? I've heard anywhere from a million, million and a half to two million or so. I've heard six hundred thousand to three million. Those are the somewhere, two ranges. Somewhere between there. Yeah. Okay. I just wondered what you'd heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's. Uh, we went to the Million Man March in Washington. It was a mass people, mm -hmm. and I mean, all the can you can you imagine that many people? Yeah, it's just in the wilderness yeah. with no McDonald's, no rest areas, no porta potties, <laughs> yes. no for a water. Generation. Yes, yeah. for forty years. Yes. Yeah. Oh my Lord! I can't even. Well, you wonder why there was a lot of 
fussing and fuming. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, it's just it boggles them. It would it would have been tough. It was tough for one day in Washington for <laughs> for eight hundred thousand a million guys for one day. But for forty years out in the middle of the wilderness, that's just mind boggling. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I, th I think the guy's stretching some things. <laughs> I, I just, you know, to take Dr. Melton uh, said to my New Testament Greek, who did his doctorate, his PhD in uh, Revelation and Apocalyptic Literature, he said there's 16 major views of Revelation. 16. 16 major ones, different slants. And uh, he said, I've studied all these years and I've come to one conclusion. The second coming is not an event. It's a person. His name is Jesus. If you're right related to him, it don't matter which 16 you buy into. You know, that's the key. And uh, you talk about Revelation where he said this generation will not pass and he no rapture in this okay that's fine I, I think everybody goes through different stuff I went through that where oh my goodness Israel became a nation in 1948 this generation shall not pass away that's 1988 you know, I mean you, I spent probably two or three years studying everything about that and I was no earthly good I was too busy looking down the road so I went through that then you go into the power thing where, you know, if I could speak in tongues and heal people and do all the stuff, then that's why I, I want that power and I went through that. You go through all this stuff, then you go through teaching. This knowledge is the thing. You just, and I'm not saying any of those things are not important. I'm not, I'm not. But, and, and I think you have to go through those things. It's like I said, Sunday, this thing is so simple. You get up in the morning. Okay, Jesus, it's you and me today. Whatever you want to do today, let's go do it. And that's it. I don't even think about it anymore. I, I, I really don't. Uh, he's going to tell me what to write in the grace line in a minute. He's going to tell me what to teach on this Sunday. Uh, I'm not really fussing. I'll just... Now when I write sermons... Uh, it's amazing how I write sermons now. I, I used to kind of plan it out. Well, I need to read this. I just get up there and God says, we're going to talk about this this week. And it's just like I go from here and I look up this verse and I look up this verse and I look in there. And I don't even think about it. It's just, I don't fret. I don't, I, I don't know. Jesus told me not to fret. And I finally listened to him. It's God speaking through you. It is. It just don't, it just don't, I don't even think about it. I don't get up there and and ask for anointing because he said, I'm the anointed one. I am the anointing. You know, it don't come on you. And, and here, I looked over at my son <coughs> coming to, to work this morning. God is not my co-pilot. Me and him are both piloting this ship today, you know, together. And I hear so many things that I've always said. You know, with me and all this stuff and following Jesus. It's, it's just, it's so much closer than that. It's what I'm thinking and what I, Jesus is saying what I'm saying. He's thinking what I'm thinking. He's feeling what I'm feeling. We are one and the same. And that's not ego or hyperbole or whatever. Because how in the world can I think or feel something that he doesn't feel? Mm -hmm. My thoughts. He says my thoughts are not your thoughts. That's the, he's talking to my soul there. Where's thoughts come from? Your soul, your mind. Mm -hmm. My thoughts are not your. No, they're not. Your thoughts are so much higher than mine, and my thoughts are what I'm feeling, thinking, or experiencing. So I have to just tell my soul, no, we don't think this. this we don't. I have the mind of Christ, and I have to surrender it to His mind. And, and it's just, I can't tell you how practical this is. How practical 
it is. You know, I, I, when I was fixing my lawnmower, I went and got the part, and it was a little crooked thing, you know, you had, and I thought that I remembered how I took it off, and then when I got back, <laughs> where does, Jesus, where does this thing go? And all of a sudden, I look over there, and there's a hole, and I put it, there it is. <laughs> Wasn't that a coincidence that no. I found where it was about the time I asked Jesus to, it was a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what people think. Direction. That's what the devil will tell you. And that's how subtle he is. He, you know, Jesus mm -hmm. told me that and the devil said, no, that was just a coincidence. He's trying to get you to doubt in your mind that Jesus is your life. Well, and, and you get the, the direction, but you have to accept it too. Sure you do. Absolutely. And uh, so, it's just, you could see where he has brought me from to where I am today, then you would know the reason why I love him. So, so anyway. All right, Papa, thank you for getting us here. Thank you for this group. Thank you for uh, for all the people that might listen to this. Uh, we just, we want everybody to know you and trust you. And I know that's your heart. We're not doing this for us. I, I, I can... I can see you and feel you urging and wanting to reach out and touch people, connect with people. And the devil tells us, you can't do that. Somebody will reject you or somebody will laugh at you. Or, and all you want to do is just encourage people, be kind to people, be loving to people, to let people see who you are. And the only way we can do that is to get out of your way. And, and what happens is you're like making a jelly sandwich. We can't spread you around without getting some on ourselves. And that's the great thing about you. You, you. All that you are, we get to experience with you. And how blessed we are. And how grateful we are. And how much we love you today. And we praise you for that. In your precious name. Amen. Amen.